From time immemorial, the sovereign nations have inhabited, protected, and preserved the land that is so-called Canada. We acknowledge this fact. The land we serve is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, and the Chippewa. Real World's offices are in Toronto, which is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Hi. Oh, good. Really, really excited to be here and to be moderating this panel, especially if our prep call is any indication of uh, the kind of conversation we're going to have. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. I think this is a really interesting topic, and I feel like we don't really talk very often about variety in live unscripted. So I think this will be really um, fascinating for people. So let me introduce the panel. We have Marsha Douglas. She's the Director of English Content International Export for CMF. Then we have Jessica Lee Fleming. She's the Director of Growth and Inclusion of CMF. We have Ngozi Paul, creator and producer of Free Up. And Maya Anik Bedward, the Director for Lido TV. So before we get started, I'm going to let each of them tell you a little bit about themselves. And I threw them a question just before we got here today and said, I'd also love to know what their favorite variety or live unscripted show is. Go ahead, Marsha. Oh, I have to go first. OK. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that we're all here together. Uh, so what's my job? Who am I? OK, so <laughs> introduce uh, yourself and then your favorite. Sure. Marsha Douglas, I'm the Director of English Content International and Export at the Canada Media Fund, and we'll talk more about Canada Media Fund, but it's the uh, largest funder of primarily broadcast um, in the country. And my favorite variety show at the moment, well, um, I am not just kissing butt, but I am really loving Lido TV and Free Up when it was on earlier in the summer. Um, and I've been watching it both on Jim and also on TikTok. Hi, bonjour everyone. I'm Jessica Lee Fleming. I'm a um, Métis Scottish settler from Penetanguishene, Ontario, so Georgian Bay Métis, which is covered by the Robinson Treaty. And uh, I am the Director of Growth and Inclusion, la Directrice de Croissance et Inclusion at the Canada Media Fund. I, I, I had a hard time picking a favorite variety show, especially because I really love sketch comedy and I was thinking about sketch and how much like Kids in the Hall was so rad for so long. <laughs> Um, and also, again, like Lido TV, really seeing Lido's, the inside of Lido's brain is really something of a treat. Um, so those two came to mind, and Baroness Van Sketch as well. Anyway, I'll pass it to you, Ngozi. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Ngozi, and um, I got to go with Chappelle Show. Chappelle show, <laughs> Chappelle show. <laughs> My name is uh, Maya Anik Bedward, and um, I'm kind of based all around Ontario, but Toronto at the moment. Um, and um, in terms of my favorite, definitely, I, Chappelle, that was a good one. I'm like, what? And I'm, I'm interested to be like, what is, like, what encompasses variety? I was going to say The Daily Show is another one. The Colbert Report was like really important when things we thought were the worst they could ever be <laughs> back then. Um, but uh, yeah, Key and Peele, when it comes to sketch oh, comedy, yes. that's who, that's, that's yes. the show. <laughs> yeah, Key and Peele's a good one. And it's funny because like, what is variety, right? I also forgot to say Tall Boys, which is, oh, yeah. Tall Boys is so Vance good. is so funny yeah, anyway. It is so good. <laughs> so we're going to show you some clips in a moment of Lido TV and Free Up, just for everybody to be on the same page in case you haven't seen everything that's out there. It's on Jam, CBC Jam. But before we get into that, I'd love to know a little bit about CMF and how they are supporting Variety and Live Unscripted and the trends that you are seeing for those two genres. Sure. So um, CMF, for those who aren't familiar, is uh, uh, we have sort of two main streams. So one is 
experimental stream, and we won't focus on that too much today. That's really focused on uh, interactive content. So if you're doing a variety and sketch in VR, maybe it sort of leans that way. But for today, we'll stick to the sort of lion's share of the um, money at the moment, which is in the convergent stream. So that's for um, we fund from pre-development, so that's before you have a broadcaster attached to development, that's when you have a broadcaster attached in some way, to uh, production. And um, we fund four genres, so drama, long-form documentary, children's and youth, and variety and performing arts. Um, and so uh, they, it's some of the four genres that we can fund, and we, as I said, fund those things through all of those different stages. And we will not get into the 35 different programs that we have. <laughs> and we'll be around after if you have more questions. But just to say that um, I think variety and performers is one of the sort of, um, it's a real incubation space in lots of ways. And I'm going to turn to Jessica in a second to talk a little bit about maybe um, the, the process around um, one of the programs that might be of particular interest to the real world audience, which is the pilot program for racialized creators too, because we're seeing actually a little bit more uptick in terms of the trends for variety and performing arts in that space. On the English side, um, uh, in looking at our annual report last year, of the top 10 shows from an audience perspective, on the English side, two were in the variety and performing arts genre, but in Quebec on the French side, you see a lot more actually in that space. And so I think of the top 10, I feel like six or seven were actually variety. Um, and it's because to your point in Gozi, it's like, what is variety, right? It's so many different things. And the other thing you'll sometimes see um, out of Quebec and in that variety space too is formats, is that there's the project itself and then there's the concept of the project and then porting that and taking that places, which I think are just a couple of trends. But Jessica, do you want to talk a little bit about our approach to inclusion. So I can mention we um, we launched at the CMF our equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy a couple of years ago, um, which has sort of been moved into this growth and inclusion space. And through that, um, we def you know in the beginning of that we defined diverse communities as being um, Black, racialized, Indigenous, as well as official language minority. And I think at some I think women was also included initially. Um, now we're moving in to also create some work around um, persons with disabilities and um, 2SLGBTQ plus folks to try to keep, like, you know, this is the thing with inclusion work is like it's ever changing and it should be ever changing as we learn more and understand more about the, the world we live in. PPRC, the Pilot Program for Racialized Communities, um, was created in response to some of the barriers that we, we recognize, right, that have prevented people from accessing mon money at the CMF. So the the program, um, like many of our programs, like it doesn't require um, a, a massive track record in production. You don't need to have a broadcast license to be funded through PPRC. This is really important because this is a major barrier that people mention and that is real, right? That you don't need that license to get the, the funding through PPRC. Um, I think if your project is in development, you need a letter of interest and then you have six months to secure a broadcaster for your project. But it's a space that allows for like a dedicated carve out of money for that will always for go for development yeah that will always go and and production you keep talking no you I'll say add, it okay. correct <laughs> add in add in jump in so like she's not always interrupting me in meetings so, come on <laughs> <'cause I'm laughs> so so there there's two deadlines for pprc and i just want to say like you can apply in any of the programs but to jessica's point it was about trying to create more space and more yeah. opportunity so in the pprc program um, for develop for pre-development and development, you need a letter of interest in development. You actually need a broadcaster commitment, but there's no minimum investment for this year's pilot. Right. We're, we change this every year a little bit yeah. as we're learning because it's a pilot. Um, and pre-development and development have the same deadline. Um, so in those ones, you're going to need to find a letter of interest. But um, I think we're seeing a lot of success. Actually, I can tell you we are because that program is massively oversubscribed. Like it's really exciting actually. Um, this year we allowed one application development, one application in pre-development, um, and those um, were not selective. It was automatic. So it's first come, first serve. And first come, first serve just you know means be there on the first day, okay? Because it almost always closes. And then sometimes, unfortunately, if um, there's such massive demand, 
we actually have to award slightly less than your ask. We look at everything we can to actually try to figure out how to um, still give you as much money as you need, but just be aware that even outside of that program, most of our first come first serve programs end up prorated. Um, but in production, to your point, which is really like one of the hardest things, you're right. Like you don't need a broadcaster on an application, but that one's selective. So if you have a broadcaster, it helps with the sort of market interest. But um, if you get the money, you have six months to actually secure that broadcaster. Yeah. We, we're still new at the jobs. <laughs> so we're helping each other navigate the information. Thanks, Marcia. Yeah. <laughs> so let's roll those clips so that we can also start talking a little bit about the creative. Because we should say that both of these projects got funded through PPRC. <laughs> can we roll them? There we go. Hi, and welcome. And welcome. Hey girl. hey girl, happy to be here. Good for you. Uh, uh. What a beautiful day to talk about colonialism. Juicy. How does it feel to be responsible for 9-11? A knee, Vito. We are giving your family's land back to the local Anishinaabe people! Sounds like freedom to me. Isn't it true that feminists don't like boys? I think we're really gonna need this episode. I had to be this delicate flower when all I wanted to do was scream. <laughs> Give a fuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like my wise indigenous grandmother always says. You're not ugly, you're just poor. 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 Where am I? History is important in all contexts. The good, the bad. A lot of us in this country don't know the history of Emancipation Day. It's been such a pivotal part of our history as a nation. Liberation should always be celebrated. So both really impactful um, and fun to watch shows like you you you're enjoying the viewing so let's talk about let's talk about Lido TV first Maya when you got the script as a director what were your initial thoughts well I I maybe I'll backtrack a little bit I I've known Lido for so Lido Pimienta is um, she's a multidisciplinary artist she's a musician she's um, a visual artist she's a comedian and I've known her for a while and so um, uh, professionally and so, and we're friends as well and so she's always pitched me her fun like like ideas she's like I had this idea for this this film where this this funny thing happens or what happens if like you know we flip the script on the abortion and it's actually you know the the men with the sperm being the ones called like she just is all she always has these like ideas where she's challenging um, the narrative, she's an activist, she's like finding humor to kind of deal with a lot of the harder topics that we're, we're faced with today. And so some of these things I was already familiar with, like in those, in, 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 her, in her mind. So when I got the pitch and then I got the script, I was like, oh, amazing, like here it all, <laughs> here it all is, this is so her. And it's been something, although the, the, the sh specific show was in development um, more recently, I think it was a year in development before it got made. Um, this has been like, these have been ideas in Lido's mind for you know, for all the time. <laughs> yeah. And Nikosi, what about you? How did Free Up come to be? You know, um, uh, so Free Up, the, the television property is sort of one thing, but um, Free Up 
for Emancipation Day, it came to be where it was in 2017, that magical year was Canada 150, and that's the first year I ever heard of Emancipation Day. My company's name is Emancipation Arts. I wrote The Emancipation of Ms. Lovely. I never heard of Emancipation Day. I'm black, and as black as they come, I think. Um, and I was not only flabbergasted, I was aghast, right? And I was like, okay, we're gonna celebrate Emancipation Day every year from now on. And there's Eloquence, co-founder of Free Up. So we had our first open mic at, at, uh, at the theater center. And we asked people, what does freedom mean to you? And, and gave it to the artists to express themselves and, and uh, do the thing and let, let Free Up grow organically um, with really a specific focus on civic engagement. And uh, we did it in 2018, 2019, 2020, we were supposed to do it at Dundas Square. And alas, 2020. Um, I had a motto, 2020 vision, for a long time. And I really didn't think 2020 was gonna be what it was. Anyways, nobody did. Um, so that's when we, we went to the CBC, um, who actually initially turned down the project before you know, everybody became whatever everybody is now, awakened or trying to be awake, or I don't know, rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. Um, they were like, oh, this is actually perfect. And I didn't mention to them that I had pitched it already, right? But they're like, we've been looking for this. And I was like, well, here we are. And so we did it in 2020. And, it, and since then, it's, it's, it's been a, a fruitful relationship and did in 2020, 2021. And, and speaking to the form of variety, it's continuing to evolve. Um, so it really was born out of a place of making, Free Up was born out of a place for making space for conversations about freedom, conversations about Emancipation Day, and using art as a vehicle to create a platform for it. Um, and then the rest of it, the business, is the stuff that kind of comes after, and, and we can talk more about that. But the vibe is like the spirit and the soul of it um, grew from hey, let's make this part of the Canadian zeitgeist, of the international zeitgeist, let's start to uh, change the conversation. One of the things I love about Free Up Emancipation Day is it is Canadian, it's not just a Toronto specific. And so how, what are some of the challenges of making the show when you have that kind of scope? <laughs> Don't make me cry. Uh, no, I'm not really going to cry. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, okay, what are some of the challenges? It's really difficult to, to make moves with like, with like landscapes, like as you were saying, things are changing and stuff is moving underneath your feet constantly. Um, there's the creative element, but there's also the production element. And, um, and I'm curious to know, how many producers are in the audience? Okay. Artists who, are, who don't, who are like, I don't produce. Any writers? Yeah, yeah. Just directors. How many do both? How many of the producers are also artists? And Right. So, like, I find it to be, like, a, a really difficult crushing experience to, to summon the strength to produce and create and cut through in the landscape as people are trying to figure out what's going on. Like it's it, a challenge is like a co-producing partner, financing, cash flow, like the, the nuts and bolts, relationships with the bank, all of those things are like incredibly stressful. Pause, then what's your creative vision, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like, and then, and then how do you, how do you then um, get the permit to do that? It's, it's, it's actually, um, there are numerous challenges, but I would say one of the biggest ones is the ecosystem and building an infrastructure that can support your creative vision. 
I want to know how you do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yo, it is, it is, I'm not like a wimp at all. It's very, very difficult. It's the infrastructure piece, right? And so like, for example, the development and pre-development, and I'm speaking, I'll speak plainly to a producer, right? Um, okay, so the deadline's September 9th or 10th or whatever, right? And all you need is a letter, but then do you have a relationship with the broadcaster so you can call somebody up and be like, hey, can I just get a letter? That's it, right? And then, as I mentioned, it's oversubscribed, so if you don't get it in on the day that it is, that it is due, within the hour that it opens, it is closed, PPRC. <laughs> no, it's not, you know, I mean, it's not, I, I, I think that it's wonderful that these things exist. And then it's so it's like, what is all of the back work that needs to be ready so that when this thing opens that you're there? It's literally like, ooh, no one's gonna like this, but Lord, you just spoke to me. It's literally like the bread line and you better line up and be there because you don't wanna be the person who's like, mm, sorry, there's no bread, there's no soup, come back tomorrow. Or in our case, it's next year because these are old relationships, right? We're like, oh my, I'll just call up Fred. Fred will send me a letter, you know what I mean? But we're like, hey, hi, nice to meet you. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce myself, da 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 da. Um, so that's like, it's mad stressful. And then you're also dealing with communities that have been underrepresented, underrepresented and marginalized, so, so there's additional friction right because they don't necessarily have the resources to perform and deliver and so like that's like not the fun part there's lots of fun but I, I think there's something you said earlier that really like hit me in the heart which is like I'm not a wimp and it's like you shouldn't have to be like a steel bull to get through the system and I think when we're talking about creators from you know diverse communities equity sovereignty seeking communities you know, we always have to consider that we're carrying so much more than just day-to-day -day operations. Like, we're, we're caretaking for our families, we're caretaking for our elders, our land, our community relations. There's so much more work that, ha that occurs by, by sheer existence, and I don't need to tell the people in this room, you all know, but I think that that's, like, one of the biggest kind of I don't know, like, I don't know if it's a goal or if it's an aspiration, but for, you know, my work at the CMF, our work at the CMF, it's like, what do we do to acknowledge that? And how do we, like, monetize the support? Like, how do you free up the cash that actually responds to that? And, you know, we're new, we're new, I'm new three months in, we're new, we're new to the strategy, we're new to the work. However, we still have a responsibility if we're saying, you know, especially publicly, like these are our values as an institution. This is what we stand for. This is what we want to do. Then like what, you know, how are we backing that up? And I'll give an example of, you know, right now we're talking about, I don't, I have no I, idea what I'm supposed to say publicly or not. So I just tell everybody everything. And then I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have <laughs> said that. Just don't tweet it. <laughs> don't tweet it. Don't tweet it. No, but I'm really trying to figure out work around mentorship um, mentorship for folks and you know previously when I was the associate director at Imaginative I, I really have a passion about mentorship because I learned on set I didn't have I didn't go to fancy film school I learned on set like a lot of people in this room you pick up gear you show up you beg to volunteer whatever and you know when we're developing mentorship programs or producer programs or whatever they are how are we also recognizing the support that's needed for like transportation accommodation subsistence elder care child care, all of these things that don't, like there's just no space in the conversation for that. And that is the thing that prevents people from making career changes, from making like long, like from not retiring after one project because they're like, I can't do this, it's too hard. So these are very big goals, but I think that they are really key to actually creating success. Marsha wants to talk, what do you want to I do? Say? I was just oh, yeah. But then I also want to say, you're here to talk about variety, but we really want to talk about systemic barriers because that's what some of this is. And. And Gozi, when you ask that question, like, 
so many of you are artists and producers because you also end up having to produce your own work so that you can find space so that you can have a space to tell your stories and to see yourselves on screen like i i don't want to name examples but there have been like great opportunities to see great shows in recent years and even though they're problematic are so desperate to see like a reflection of you know my culture on screen that like you're like that's a great show and then you're like oh apparently it's not but um <laughs> what i will say is like the broadcaster letter like i'm sorry guys like it, like that's baked into like the the conditions of our funding but that's where we're trying to do everything we can to help work around it and and we can we have to talk back about what these shows are because they're awesome like watch them but if we have a chance like jessica can talk about some of the other work you're doing through sector development to like enable training to like you know partner with events like this to create opportunities to try to break down spaces to create networking opportunities because it's it is important to your point and the i'm going to say a really boring business affairs thing for a second sorry but it's like here's one of my like super boring if you're even if you're not starting out get a big calendar at the beginning of the year and start writing down all of the deadlines including because John Taylor was on the panel before this, like IPF deadline stuff, and we can talk about we partner with IPF on a program, but um, it does take time to work back to get all those documents ready, and also like don't be afraid to call and reach out if you need help, and even and I hope you've had this too. Like, there's a pretty good community out there to reach out and talk to like other producers, other writers, other talent who's coming up or learning their way through it to help support each other because admittedly it isn't that much fun you're staring at like a thousand line excel budget sheet and you're like i don't know do i need this person like what even are they um and sometimes you don't but it's a good way to help demystify it because it it can be a real challenge right yeah it can and be. can i also add that also, there's the PPRC, which is Pilot Program for Racialized Communities, but then there's also everything else. There's all of the other programs, and so those are all open yes. as well, which is a really, I think, important, at least that's, that was something that I had to shift, where it's just like, oh, there's a black fund, I, I could get it, you know? But then there's also all of the regular funds um that 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 are open to you as well and it's the same work it's the same work maya can we talk a little bit about um the variety choice to tell us or to make a show in this format because if you're flipping through and you just happened on Lido tv you might think it's a children's show until you actually start watching it and then you realize maybe not so much but there were some specific choices made and i'd love to know a bit of that process and why yeah well I think the show first and foremost it's a it's a parody like it's a parody so um, we there's a lot of parodies in it a lot of formats that um, we make fun of but Lido if you know her work you know she's an activist she um, is really funny and she's a talented musician and she's a mother that's a big part of who she is um, and she was a young mother, so she spent a lot of time um, caring for her children um, and watching shows with them. So I think she was inspired by, like, she's prolific in her knowledge of cinema across genres and television across genres. But I think she was inspired by the children's shows that her children are watching and the children's shows of her childhood to kind of use this as an entry point to talk about some of the more difficult conversations she wanted to have and not, you know, have people turn away right away. And, and I think that's why parody is so amazing is that you can like bring people in with something familiar and then turn it on its head to really make a strong point. So um, yeah, and Lido's, Lido's work is always very colorful and there's a lot of um, humor, but a lot of absurdity. And I think that the children's world and having puppets was a big part of like bringing that absurd, but almost so humorous and fun energy to the show. And when were you filming this? When were yeah, you, so were you we, dealing with? Uh, we originally were going to film in January of, um, what year are we? 2022? <laughs> 2022. And then Omicron hit. 
Um, so we had to postpone the shoot by a few weeks and um, hope that no one uh, in production got sick. Um, so we were shooting uh, at the end of January 2022, February 2023. We shot everything in, I think, about two weeks, two and a half weeks. It was very intense um, because uh, um, there was a lot of different types of things to do. How many different days? Um, we, I think we had maybe four or five in-studio days with the puppets and with the interviews and with the sketch comedy. And then we had three shoot days for all the short films. It was a lot. It's very intense. It was very, very intense. Um, yeah, I'm very proud of uh, our team. We... <laughs> We worked really hard on that. Um, we had an amazing crew. Um, it was me and Alicia Harris who also directed um, some of the episodes. So we worked, uh, we, we did a lot of, we did as much prep as we could. I mean, the timelines were tight. We, we got the scripts in January. So we were just like hitting the ground running and, um, but um, yeah, the, the producers were just like so strong, Lido's so strong, um, and everyone who was a guest or who was like creative really gave it their all. We all believe so much in the project. I mean, we put all the, the money on screen, it's there, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, but like we all just like poured our heart and soul and time into this to like get it to that level. Um, yeah, it was a real like passion project for so many of us. I'm curious for both of you, when you're creating this show, there's education is definitely a through line. You're teaching and explaining certain things to people, but who are you making your shows for? Who are you speaking to? Can I ask you, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Could you do it again? <laughs> Could I do it again? Um, I, I would, I am, I really want a season two. So yes, I really love this show. I had such a blast making it. And I realized that comedy is like my thing and I want to work in this realm in television after this because I came from a doc background. Deal. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. So like this is where I, I, it really like opened up something in me. Um, but I think like I would say, you know, like these types of shows, like it's on CBC Gem, it's not on, it's not on CBC like main programming. There are these like spaces to create and to experiment and we do that and we do that with more resources than we're given. And I think for us to do this again, we need more resources. I think we need more support because we like, we blew it out of the water. It's a great show, but we really, we all sacrifice so much of ourselves um, to, to do this, everyone, everyone on set, everyone worked so hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm going to follow up your question then, Ngozi, and ask you, are you planning to do Free Up Emancipation Day again in 2023? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll, 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 we'll keep doing it. it. It will keep growing. And, um, you know, my goal for Free Up is that... Um, is that it will, you know, be taken over and it will just become a part of, you know, the Canadian cultural landscape. I had a conversation with um, an ex somebody, and we were talking about Canada Day, and I, the video they said so-called Canada. I think that's really funny. <laughs> Something, um, and she's like, "Well, but Canada Day, they they have blah blah blah," and I was like, "And so why not Emancipation Day?" like what what is valuable so um i hope that it that it grows and it becomes a, an international celebration and that um together as a society we can decide what we celebrate and why and what our values are you know like what are we partying for on the fourth of july or whatever um and uh the audience for me is i think family i think family like you know like like summer family barbecue vibes like the times when we all get together and you got your cousins and you got your your mom and your grandma and they're oh it's a good show that's nice i like it you know like all of that is like that gives me life it's community so so um i i want it to be something that that people feel comfortable with and that they can take as their own and go, oh, how am I gonna celebrate Emancipation Day next year? And, and, and what does freedom actually mean to me? Um, I'm interested in turning the conversation in that direction. 
Do you think a lot about, because I, I personally feel like we don't invest enough in letting people know these great programs exist. Um, you know, I feel like we're, all, we're missing that a little bit in this country. And so how do you develop audience? How do you find the audience when we don't have the investment to, you know, compete against the world for letting them know what we have here? Well, I said it was hard, right? <laughs> it's, it's um, that's part of our, that's our new part of our work where another part of the conversation is they're like, okay, well, you don't just make the show, but then you also have to uh, produce the marketing for it. Um, luckily for us, we have been engaged with community since the beginning. So, so a lot of how it's grown has been an organic piece. Um, but I really would say it's the way that we operate is really, I've, I've learned is as a creator um, and as a and as a performer, um, you know, we used to say, "Talk to them, listen to them, heal them." So it's like it's a call and answer. So it, you know what I mean? It's it's how do you kind of think outside of marketing budgets? And you know what I mean? It's like how do you connect with community in an in an organic way? So that's that's our focus. Can, can I ask something? Because I think something that's a theme in, in both of these works, too, is the, the sort of format of the variety in which you bring it is there are also these different points of connection and almost different genres built in mm -hmm. to the actual project itself. And, you know, was that intentional in terms of trying to serve your audiences different ways in order to sort of connect with the message, connect with the content? like? Um, even free up this this year, right? It has all these animation pieces woven in, and like I love the. It starts with such joy, right? Like it really like welcomes you to the content, even though. But also, each of them had, as you said, these educational pieces, like almost documentary, like that moment when Lido is doing the, the hair, right? Like they really provide you different moments of that content. So I was just like, is that part of your strategy in this? Because variety, as you said from the beginning, is like. A variety of things. <laughs> I totally. I think that like um, Lido being a musician and like being very prolific online, like she not only is watching lots of TV and films, but she's like she's just she knows everything that's out there in the zeitgeist. And so she was thinking about all of these pieces also as like standalone things that she could you know connect people. Um, it, uh, kind of introduce herself like a lot of the docs are in Colombia where she was uh, born and grew up and so she wanted to kind of introduce her Colombia to people who might not know and also represent the people in her communities there and then she also wanted to create like really shocking <laughs> short films that would you know make people laugh and also piss people off and start a conversation like when she talks about audiences she talks about everyone she's like I want it all I want the love I want the hate I want the like she just wants it all because she feels like that's how you start a real conversation so each of these all of these pieces were kind of conceived as standalone things and then um, it was the it was like bringing in the puppets and thinking about the themes in which these different pieces could kind of like be brought together because there's a lot of intersecting themes in all of them but so it was actually I'd say for the writers and for Lido one of the hardest thing was like choosing what were those like six because there's a theme for each episode and there's six episodes what are those themes we're going to focus on this season and what are the the pieces that we can fit into that because there was like a million other sketches that had been conceived <laughs> before they um ch like windled it down to just what we could fit in originally i think was supposed to be 15 minutes 12 14 minutes but we just created so much good stuff that they're 20 minute episodes now we like that was the decision that happened in post-production because we just like we wouldn't have been able to fit everything in yeah that's one of the cool things about um being on a streaming yeah. platform is that you can you don't have to you know make sure that it's 22.5 totally you know what I there's mean? a lot of like flexibility yeah. and i think that and that speaks to like being able to share these things online like you know when when you have a when you have a short film that's like three minutes it's like perfect to put up you know on on tiktok or something i mean not tiktok but like you know 
uh, Facebook or what are people? I'm so I'm not. A, I'm, I'm, not I'm, I'm not the tech I've, person. That's Lido. I've never <laughs> been on TikTok. I've I've never been on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're I don't like even a know bit. how it works. It's a crazy world. I like I in the pandemic. I dabbled I'm so just watch stuff. It's it's a crazy world. It's very my fascinating. niece is like, <laughs> come on, Auntie Gogo. -Go. <laughs> She's so over me. I just I don't I yeah. I'm so like, late. I feel like all you've missed on TikTok is how to shave food into other shapes. So <laughs> don't worry about it. It's fine. You'll, you'll catch up. I think Lido is a good fit on TikTok, though. I think yeah. you can. And I'm like, no. you could totally take parts of the free up and put it there and find yeah. new audiences and find audiences. As, and so I just need to, I do not make TikToks. I can yeah. only watch. Not that. yet. Totally. And, and I, I think know, the, I don't the, know what they're the doing music, now. Like from, she, sorry, I don't uh, know what they're doing now, but I know for. Uh, at least last year, maybe year before, TikTok was trying to have longer form content on there. So it certainly is a platform that's trying to be a space for yeah. more than just, what was it, food shaved yeah, yeah. things, and, which is fun. You can get lost, hours of your time can get lost down there, in there. But I will, And I will add too, like, because I was speaking, uh, maybe it was like a year and a half ago now, I was having a lot of meetings with the people at TikTok, the person from Australia and the person from New York, and because native TikTok is so huge, right? and. They, it, it was really interesting to see them sort of um, predicting the the their place in like the streamer content provider, and they were like, "We really want to be like the like the creative, like the first place that creatives come," and and it was like, it, "Are you kind of seeing it in real time happening now?" I, so there, it, I, it's not just about shaving am, food. Yeah, I am curious. So be, with both these shows being on CBC Jam, what are some of the other places that you're seeing at CMF that people are getting variety and live unscripted to I mean, show up? I, I think it really depends on who that market partner. Like this is where it comes back to CMF works with a variety of market partners. Um, in the experimental, like John Taylor was here right before this talking about IPF, for example, like there is a stream for linear video in the experimental stream where you don't need a broadcaster on the web series front. And that's where even things like TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, like that's also a great place to play if you're a content creator or you're trying stuff. Um, one of the things um, that I... That, this has nothing to do with variety for a minute. Maybe it does. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to develop content, to test ideas, to cultivate audience. And I think that's something that um, that has fewer barriers. And also, depending on the type of content you're making, sometimes you can find a different home or a different audience. And having that data and analytics and that exposure can help you when you bring it back to the more traditional partners because you're either bringing an audience with you or you're bringing, you know, as I said, like data engagement things. Like, you know, there's a platform, for example, called Wattpad that's all writing. It's the YouTube of writing. But if you were writing like a super genre piece or even in this space, like variety sketch, like do a character sketch, like write the backstory. Go on TikTok, make a one minute video in a character, for example, test it out. And then when you come to the other, to back to the sort of more traditional market, like your ability to come to CBC, I would guess, if I'm not CBC, so don't hold me to this. But <laughs> you came to CBC and you're like, here's this TikTok video of my character blank, and I want to create a variety show around this, but I have a million views and 30,000 likes. Like, there's something really compelling in terms of explaining the market interest. And especially um, if you're newer or if you're coming at something that may be um, not as uh, easy for someone who doesn't have your lived experience to understand, but to be able to demonstrate that is one thing. And like an interesting YouTube stat, now apparently I work at YouTube. Um, <laughs> in Canada, YouTube creators, like YouTubers, 90% of their audience actually comes from outside of Canada. And so it's this like totally flipping things on its head discussion around, you know, what are those opportunities? How are we taking Canadian stories to the world? And I will say like, CMF is not in the position to make major changes yet. Like there's like all sorts of regulatory stuff happening right now, but it's something we recognize as part of that ongoing discussion that you were talking about around where are those barriers and where are the opportunities to sort of recognize that and to find audiences and to tell stories that maybe aren't finding a fit in the traditional market. To totally. Just to add to that, um, so Lido TV uh, is right now available on CBC Gem in Canada, but Lido, because she is like so, um, well, she's a performer, she's touring, she's like got a huge audience. 
um, people know her and she's also very well known in Latin America. So I was in the Dominican Republic shooting my doc and all the artists and filmmakers I was talking to over there were just like, we like they didn't want to talk about anything else but Lido TV. They're like, when are we gonna see Lido? Like they were just so excited, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess it's it's only in Canada. And they're like on their edge of their seat, like can't wait to see it. And there's like this whole international audience that's out there just like waiting to be able to see it. So I think um, and Lido had that very much in mind when she made the show. She wanted to like speak to Canadian audience, but also speak to an international audience and figuring out how to make that more part of what we do because social media is, it's, it, it's, it's that. It's like that is what it is. It is about connecting just outside of your like um, immediate community, so. And so if people, because obviously creating content takes money, there are opportunities at CMF to come and do find some funding to do some stuff that maybe isn't traditional broadcaster property or um I, I, so it all it comes back to money <laughs> it sort yeah i know money time resource intention intention time and resources but yes um yes there are some um and what i will say is as i said earlier it's like more than 30 different programs some are international partnerships actually to try to foster those opportunities um as i said they sort of range from the term pre-development is a little funny, but essentially it's before you have a broadcaster who's like committed to your project, there's development money, um, and then there's that production money. Most of it in the convergent stream does need a Canadian broadcaster, but I will also say that um, Canadian broadcaster, there are some who are the big guys, like we are in the building of one, uh, Rogers, and they have performance envelopes and Go to our website and then if you have questions like call jessica ryan will help you try to navigate it <laughs> and also we work really closely with telefilm who helps administer our programs so i don't want us to like get lost in the weeds but um i will say there are programs that sort of work through these like big partners but then also we have lots of programs and even in the performance envelope program which is our biggest one we have this stream called alternative access and there are a lot of very small broadcasters who may not have an envelope but who can actually trigger that money too um, because we are trying to open the doors both for creators from all communities to find those spaces, but also for small broadcasters who are serving different communities to find ways into the programs. Um, and then outside of that, as I said, that experimental stream, um, because we sort of converge into the broadcasters who are licensed, so everything else is experimental. And I know some of it's less experimental like video but but there are lots of spaces because i think that's also a recognition that sometimes as a creator i'm looking at both of you right the stories that you're creating sorry jessica you can create stories too um <laughs> but like the stories that you're working on they don't fit into a box like that's what you're talking about and so sometimes you do need to find a space where there's room for content and then outside of that if we aren't the right fit like maybe we can point you in a direction to find another fit. Like, um, I don't know who else was on the panel before us. I'm sorry, but John, I know is here from IPF. It's one of the many CIPFs out there. Most of those don't require a broadcaster, for example. Uh, and, you know, we can't tell too many things out of school, Jessica, but we are trying to talk to some of those other players to see where we can create partnership opportunities um, in those spaces too. It's recognizing all and, those spaces. And I would also add that's part of where, se I don't want to speak too much to this, but like that's where our sector development portfolio also comes in, where we support real world, real Asian, imaginative. These are just festivals, but there's other work too, BIPOC, TV and film, ISO, BSO. Like it's a, it's a way to kind of give the money over back to the communities to say like, okay, you're, you know, here's 100K, cr create a program or create a, like even the COVID relief money we gave out, it was very like no strings in a lot of ways, like just, just apply and take your piece so that you can keep, you know, surviving as a as a as a company, as an independent company. So um, the programs for content creation are not always as straightforward, but there's other spots where we're trying to really push money out the door, essentially. So let's um, we only have about 10 minutes. So let's just quickly open it up to all of you. If you have questions, we've got some over here. Safi is just bringing the mic. Hello, uh, my name is Mustafa. Thank you all so much for very, being very honest. It's like great, it's fun to be a creator and hear other creators' experiences. My question is pretty specific. Um, 
Uh, I got development funding with Crave this year through the PPRC program, which is amazing. Thank you for making that program. Um, and you were talking about proration, and we were told that it was going to be a slight proration, and then the proration was, I wouldn't say necessarily slight, considering the budget, but it is what it is. My question is, um, now we have a gap in our budget because we're at the end of the year, the year turns over in April, the broadcasters only have so much money left over, you know, the system. I'm just curious, it, what other, in your experience, creators who have been trying to sort of supplement their budget after the proration happens, what other programs could you apply for or have you applied for to sort of make up that difference? Or what are things or or places you could go to make up the difference. Does that, does that question make any sense? Great. Yes. Okay, I, I'll, I'll take the first pass. Anyone fill in if I miss something. Um, what I would say is, um, this, this is gonna sound lame, but <laughs> talk to your analysts a little bit because I think it, be, it actually becomes a project by project consideration. You can also change the deliverables and what makes sense based on the money that you got. Um, and that's where it depends on a bit of a conversation between you, what's available, and then you and your partner, like you said, Crave in this case, in terms of what's expected, what it's going to take to get that to green light. Um, I, for example, especially someone like Crave, Bell has an envelope. They may have money left in their envelope to top it up or to look at it, but that's where it's a, a dialogue with them now as your partner to sort of figure out, um, well, as your broadcaster buyer but um to figure out you know what was needed i i don't know the details of your project we can talk after if you want, but it's like it, let's pretend you were proposing six scripts maybe you only need three um uh, and or it depends on where you are we're here in ontario for example like there are other programs through other partner agencies like ontario creates for example who maybe i don't know but like maybe it's a fit for their global market export fund because you need development money in order to go to market with this thing. I don't think they would normally fund screenwriting, but I don't know what else was in that development that maybe that's a fit there. It's sort of like, where are you at? What do you need in that particular project's case? And then um, looking at that as one of the ideas. Thank you. Can I just say something that I've just learned this year after having been a producer for I think now decades, right? Go and ask for what you need to do what you have to do. And be like, there are other people who aren't us, who they're like, I didn't get the money I need. I'm gonna need another uh, 20,000. <laughs> they're like, I can't do it for this. Like, they just ask. go and ask. Well, okay, fine. And I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> how did you do that? Like, it, it, it's like, there's like, it was like, okay, well, I didn't get what I need. And okay, so I'll, I'll figure it out. And you know, we go to work, we roll up our sleeves, immigrant, you know, children of immigrants. At least I am, right? Caribbean heritage. That's what I, you know, so you're dying and you're killing yourself to make it happen. You put your whole heart and love into it. You've been working on it for a million years, right? Then you get, 50% of what you need to actually do the thing, go and ask for what you need because at least give them the opportunity to say no. That is, I just learned that and I'm still like, ah, this is what I need. Like I'm still like shoulders up cringe because I feel the shame of my poverty and my background when I have to go to them and ask, please give me some money to make my show, eh, please, right? go and ask and it feels uncomfortable and you have to cross the line and do it, but just try. And then you can say, they told me no. We have a question here, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Sheldon Shaw, I'm a producer. I had a question for I think both of you, two of you. Um, I work for a show called Caribbean Vibrations. They highlight Caribbean culture all throughout the world. I'm trying to figure out if this show constitutes as a variety show. It's been on the air for 20 years and they do need funding every season. So I'm trying to figure out if that falls under a variety show or not. So they basically, so they basically, they basically interview like, um, you know, uh, founders of the festivals or like a concert or basically like, um, like we went to St. Martin, we covered that entire um, festival for a whole week. 
and there was performances, there's food, there's so we just a lot of interviews going on. So I wonder if that's a classified as variety or not. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah. What do you think? I I feel like we should connect a little after. Okay. What I'll say is we can walk through kind of there are definitions like oh my god this is so boring but um, for CMF when we look at variety it has to fall into the CRTC's programming categories eight and nine. So otherwise, it might be magazine or entertainment or lifestyle. So that's, that's like a little tip that we can look at. And um, if you're not sure, we can set you up with um, a sort of pre-assessment so that you can talk it through before you would be looking at coming in. Um, and if anybody wants to talk about CRTC category 8 or 9, let me know. But like, we can do that. Variety, you need 51% of it to be performance. But but I was like trying to figure out if it's borderline documentary. No, it's a yeah. that's a magazine show. That's what I was. But thinking. as Jessica was saying, but you can start to adjust things to to make it work so that you are um, so that you can, especially something like Caribbean Camera, like that could be an opportunity to to sort of reshape the show and access a whole bunch of different funding, still with it um, having the same type of programming, the same type of values, but then open to some of the, um, I don't know, the logistics. Yeah. And we see that, ha we were, I just did a focus group with, um, a small focus group with some folks from the indigenous community who are saying like, that's how they get into the indigenous language program. They're like, we work our shows around the route. It's not ideal. But it, it, it can help you build up your portfolio and your credits, and then it gives you a bit of leverage to be like, okay, we've done this great show, and now we want to like bust it out of the water and make it even bigger and badder, and or whatever that is. So there's it's there's a, there are strategies within the strategies, you know, to to try to get your your the money that you need for your work. We have a question in the back. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so what are some other ways the CMF is um, planning to strengthen strengthen our relationship with people around the world? To be quite frank, we do better across the world in terms of like our content, in terms of people not, you know, washing down our authentic story. So what are some strategies and ways that the CMF is looking for and doing? I mean, personally, I really don't ever want anyone to try to like dilute their story ever. And I think what I think is really great about the variety format and even PPRC for in a way is that it's encouraging people to explore more nuance and more variety in the kind of content that we fund, in the kind of content that we engage with in Canada. Like we're, it's time, you know, and, and like I've heard people say things like, and I think it's true that, you know, Sometimes the legacy companies are really interested in, um, let's say, like an indigenous story that really affirms a colonial view of indigenous people. And so they're like making the content that they know is going to get greenlit. But that's not going to change until there's more variety of content. So the more like I would just say, like you, it sounds like you know what's in your heart. And so it's important to honor that and honor the work that you are meant like part of your purpose and why you're here, the story you're here to make. If the more you stick to what you can speak to honestly, the more appealing it will be to more people because we, we know, we can sense when something's off. So, I mean, I would just keep, say this is the time, so keep, keep going with it. And maybe, I don't know if there's more t technical strategy in that that Marsha wants to add, but I'm just like, I just want to pump you up about this, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take away from what Jessica just said. Okay. I think that's the that's like the thing to hold to. Yeah. Because I, I think that's the thing that you're starting to see globally. Maybe I can't speak as much to what CMF is doing specifically, because we're, everyone is sort of at this like crossroads point when you start to look at the broader like regulatory stuff that's happening right now with new legislation. And I, that is part of it, right? It's sort of recognizing that the Canadian system was this sort of closed system. And now the world operates within our borders, which creates both global opportunities and also more competition. So there's a, a like a really dynamic dialogue happening about all of these things. But that's where like certainly, you know, there is a goal. It's part of the CMF's goal is to help support Canadian content for Canadian audiences, but also content that is going to take those stories and help 
bring that out to the world and, and recognizing those world audiences as part of the success of Canadian I don't want to, I'm getting the wrap, so I, I, I feel like I have to say goodbye. There are questions though, so please, I think if you want to come up and talk to people, please do that. Um, and I just, um, My, my email is jfleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G, at cmf-fmc.ca. It, it, oh, I, I, we can say, but essentially the CMF's website not, is, no, yeah, they are, but, but the CMF's website is cmf-fmc.ca, and all of our emails are first initial last name. cmf-fmc, so Canada Media Fund Fonds Media Canada dot ca. We're speaking English here, but we are bilingual. You can call us and speak French. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I just oh, want to say one thing, just because it's like, I don't know, I think closing, my closing thoughts, maybe with like, I don't know, closing thoughts is like a couple of things as produ for producers and, and creators, because it is difficult, is, is um, to really take care of yourself. That's something that I'm really just learning um, as a woman of color, um, that we don't have to be everybody's workhorse, including yourself. Um, that's how we can have longevity, and it's, I'm l really learning what that is. Um, and uh, like, we are life. So if we don't care for ourselves, we are not gonna be able to give life. So that's like my closing thing is just like, please don't kill yourself. I've had burnout several times. <laughs> and, um, and so finding sustainable ways to do it and create your own ecosystem, um, that, that's, like, that, that is what drives me in. And uh, yeah, I share that with you. Thank you. And that's a really great way to end it. Thank you for all of your time, your talent. Thank you for your time, your questions.